Well, when we start talking about the European Enlightenment, immediately a general question arises about these uh, ways in which we categorise historical periods. And it, over the last 30 years or so, historians have started to ask questions about categories like the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, the Reformation, Scientific Revolution and the Enlightenment. And the tendency has been to see these as the construction or invention of historians. And then the question becomes how useful are these ways of categorising periods of history and do they help us understand what's going on? And I think the reviews of these categories have been mixed. So the Middle Ages, we, we start to ask whether this really makes sense as a, as a period between classical antiquity and the modern period, for example. Uh, we ask, was there really a revolution in science? And if there was a revolution, was it a scientific one? Um, were there multiple reformations? Uh, and when we get to the question of enlightenment, I think what historians have tended to say is that there was a view about the enlightenment, say, let's call it the, the 60s view, that saw the enlightenment as essentially a reaction of reason against authority, tradition and religion. Um, a view that saw the Enlightenment as essentially a French uh, movement primarily uh, and a key movement that led to the modern world as we know it. Now since that time I think historians have wanted to, to muddy the waters a little bit and to say well actually it's not really that simple. That there were in fact multiple Enlightenments and that there was a French Enlightenment and an English Enlightenment and a Scottish Enlightenment and a German Enlightenment. And these enlightenments are characterised in quite different sorts of ways. So, for example, it, it might be true that in the French Enlightenment there was a strong anti-religious component um, and, and the, uh, the promotion of reason as the instrument through which we would escape uh, the, the, the powers of religion, as it were. But if we look across the continent in England, we see a rather different story. We see an enlightenment that to some extent was informed by religious concerns and shaped by them, uh, and that those concerns in a sense remain part of, of the movement. So that just gives you an example of how historians have wanted to talk about uh, this, how historians have wanted to talk generally about historical periodization and what they've had to say about the Enlightenment in particular. So if we think then about what the key characteristics of the Enlightenment were, we think about perhaps some key characteristics that we might see across the board. And I think one of them is, traditionally it's been conceived to be uh, the, the elevation of reason. I think we need to add to that experience. And, and these are actually two quite different things. That, that the idea that we see in England, for example, is that reason actually needs to be held in check by our experiences. And so, for example, we have a distinction set up between an experimental experience-based approach and a speculative rational approach. So English scientists, for example, were critical of French scientists who they saw as over-rationalising. And, and the problem with the the rationalistic approach to things was that it, it was insufficiently disciplined by experimentation and experience. So if we talk about a key characteristic of the Enlightenment as being reason, we need to be very careful and I think we need to qualify that and say, well, actually it's reason and experience or reason and experiment. So I think that's one, one key uh, element of it. The question then is, is reason and experiment of reason and experience necessarily opposed, for example, to religion? And I think the answer is no, not necessarily. In, indeed, arguably, um, the emphasis on experiment and experience was itself grounded in um, religious thinkers arguing for the primacy of religious experience. And interesting, interestingly, in 17th century England, uh, they talk about experimental religion, by which they mean a religion that is based and grounded in experience. And this to sometimes, sometimes this, this experience-based religion is opposed to speculative religion or, or religion based on authority. 
But the general point I want to make here is that to, to elevate experience and experiment is not necessarily to promote a view that's anti-religious. Indeed, I think in the specific case of England, it's promoted by uh, what is initially, at least, um, an approach to religion. Um, now, other, other elements of what we might call uh, the Enlightenment, so reason and experience as opposed to authority, um, a belief in progress, I think, is, is a key part of Enlightenment across the board. And this is a belief that we can actually do better than the ancients. So I think up until the 17th century, there was a strong belief in the superiority of the ancients in all of the disciplines across the board. So the literary disciplines, the philosophical disciplines, the scientific disciplines. And in the 17th century, people first start to think, hey, maybe we can actually do better and move beyond what it was that the ancients had come up with. And so I think progress would be another uh, characteristic of enlightenments um, right across the board. And then I think the third thing we can say um, is that there's a tendency to, uh, to move religion into the sphere, into the private sphere to some extent, but also a tendency to emphasise the role of reason in establishing and warranting religious beliefs. So a move to a rational religion is it's a very conspicuous feature of the English Enlightenment, I think. But if we ask what, is the, what happens in the Enlightenment to religion, I think a couple of things. And one is an attempt to show the rational foundations of religion becomes very important, but also a, 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 an increasing tendency to move religion into the private sphere because religion, uh, in the wake of the wars of religion that ravaged Europe, is perceived to be um, potentially uh, um, potentially dangerous for social stability and peace if it's not adequately controlled. Well, if we think about another historical um, periodization scheme, the scientific revolution is a key one. And the scientific revolution is typically thought to have started around, say, Copernicus and finishing up with Newton. And we see an enormous change in what people think about the physical universe at this period. And arguably, at this time, we see the foundations of modern science being laid. And some of the key figures in this movement, probably not Copernicus himself, but Galileo, who establishes the, the Copernican theory that the, the Earth moves around the sun and not vice versa. Descartes, the French philosopher scientist, is a key figure. Uh, 17th century figure. Um, Isaac Newton, of course, who comes up with uh, the, the universal law of gravitation. Um, uh, and Robert Boyle, another Englishman, who is, is, a, is a key figure in establishing the new matter theory and the new experimental approach to knowledge. And I can put in perhaps one final name there, Francis Bacon, who is very important, not as a practicing scientist so much, but as someone who establishes the methods on which science should operate. Now, if we take someone like Descartes, for example, um, D Descartes makes a number of, of, of key uh, contributions. We tend to think of Descartes often as a philosopher who came up with the famous cogito and, and who sets out philosophical arguments for you know, why I exist and why God exists and so on. But actually, Descartes was really more like a practicing scientist whose philosophy comes later to justify his scientific activities. Um, Descartes, I think, is a key figure in, in establishing, first of all, an atomic matter theory, that matter is made up of particles, a mechanical view of the universe. The universe is like a vast machine. And Descartes also comes up with a, a, a crucial idea for modern science, that we should be looking for laws of nature. And Descartes says that explicitly says that laws of nature are not so much inherent in, in the cosmos itself, but that laws of nature are actually divine commands that God has com 